It is the year 1970, and a man named Li Zui Chang is riding a bus along a remote stretch of road along the eastern slopes of the Hulan Mountains, a mountain range in Ningxia, an autonomous region in northwest China that borders Inner Mongolia. The bus ride has been very long and tiring for Li Zui Chang, and he's been drifting in and out of sleep, bored out of his mind from an uneventful ride and the even more uneventful scenery of farmland and desert, when suddenly something in the distance catches his eye. He begins to see small mounds in the distance that are shaped like cylinders and bread rolls, and his eyes widen as he sees more and more of these mounds popping out of the ground, until he can see what looks to be hundreds of them. What's more interesting is that amongst these hundred or so dirt mounds, there are several mounds that are huge and shaped like pyramids. G'day everyone, I'm your host Stephen, and welcome to another episode of the Bamboo History Podcast. For those who are new, welcome. This is a podcast about Chinese and East Asian history. If you like this type of content, please subscribe to my podcast to tune in to more exciting historical content. I also have an Instagram at Bamboo History Podcast, which has visual content for my episodes, teasers, and additional historical content too small to fit into a podcast. So please check out my Instagram and give me a follow as well. Thanks. To my existing listeners and my Bamboo Historians, thanks again for your support and for being with me on this journey. All right, now let's get straight into it. Those weirdly shaped dirt mounds and pyramids that Li Zui Chang saw on that day were in actual fact tombs of a kingdom that existed in China a thousand years ago. A kingdom that was officially called Da Xia or Great Xia, but commonly referred by historians as Xi Xia, spelt XI, XIA, and known in English as the Western Xia Dynasty. This episode will be about those mysterious pyramids of China, the Xi Xia tombs. Before we talk about the tombs, let's go through briefly on how the Xi Xia Dynasty came about. The Xi Xia Dynasty existed between the years 1038 to 1227 in the area of northwest China, now commonly known as the Ningxia Autonomous Region the Gansu and Qinghai provinces. The Xi Xia dynasty has been included by modern historians as a Chinese dynasty. However, the Xi Xia were not ruled and was not a dynasty of Han Chinese people. Rather, the Xi Xia was a kingdom ruled by an ethnic group called the Tanguts, or pronounced in Chinese as Dangxiang, spelt D-A-N-G-X-I-A-N-G. No one really knows for sure where the Tanguts came from. Maybe they popped out from some rocks. What we do know is that they were possibly related to the Tibetans and were descended from a Tibeto-Burman people called the Chang, Q-I-A-N-G. Prior to the creation of the Xi Xia dynasty, the Tanguts were mostly shepherds roaming around the mountains and steppes of northwestern China. As described in the Book of Sui, the Tangits were described as yak and sheep farmers and, quote, knew not how to sow and reap, meaning that they didn't dabble in agriculture and crop farming. However, the fortunes of the Tangits changed during the late Tang Dynasty in the 9th century when they helped the Tang Dynasty in defeating a large rebellion. The Tang government then rewarded the Tangit leader, Tuo Ba Si Gong, a large swath of land in northwestern China for him to rule made him the Duke of Xia, and changed his surname from Tuo Ba to the Han Chinese surname of Li. This was a big honour for the Tangut leader, as the surname of the Tang emperors was also Li, which meant the Tang emperor now treated the Tangut leader as part of their family and officially recognised the Tanguts as belonging to the Tang Chinese empire. Fast forward almost 200 years and Tuo Ba Si Gong's descendant Li Yuanhao created an official imperial dynasty and kingdom for the Tanguts, and declared himself as the first emperor of Xi Xia in the year 1038. Having officially created a homeland and country for his people, he decided to create an organised society just like his Han Chinese neighbours, and created government institutions 
a national currency, and most importantly, a written Tangut script, which was modelled after the Hanzi Chinese characters. As the first emperor of the Xisha dynasty, he also honoured his father and grandfather by also naming them as emperors and created tombs for them fit for an emperor. Li Yuanhao reigned for 10 years and died in the year 1048. After him, a subsequent nine emperors ruled the Xisha kingdom until the year 1227 when the Xisha was conquered by the Mongols. Now that we understand a bit about the Xisha, I will now explain these mysterious pyramids of China. The Xisha tombs are located around 35 kilometers west near the present city of Yinchuan in northwest China and sits at the foot of the eastern slopes of the Helan Mountains, spelt H-E-L-A-N, which is a remote mountain range with desert terrain. The Xisha tombs are estimated to be around 50 square kilometers large, although archaeologists believe that it could even be larger, as there are still tombs yet to be uncovered. In the Xisha tombs, nine of the tombs belong to the Xisha emperors. These nine emperors include the first emperor Li Yuanhao, six of his successors, and both his father and grandfather. The last three emperors never had a tomb, as by that time the Xisha was at war with the Mongols and the kingdom was in a state of disarray that they didn't even have the time and energy to care about the burials of these emperors. The emperor tombs, surprise surprise, were the ones shaped like the pyramids. The pyramids, however, were not perfectly shaped pyramids like the ones in Egypt. Rather, these pyramids resembled termite mounds, with the pyramid consisting of multiple layers of earth stacked on top of one another to form the pyramid shape. No one knows really for certain why the Xisha built the emperor tombs in the shape of pyramids. The emperor tombs all had similar structures and layouts. The emperor tomb complexes had three sections. The outer section, or layer, was known as the outer city, or Wai Cheng, which had stone towers and stele pavilions, which are large stone structures filled with either carvings of pictures or text. The second section, which was within the outer city, was known as the Moon City, or Yue Cheng. The Yue Cheng was created to differentiate their tombs from the Han Chinese tombs that they had modelled the tomb layout after. The last layer, and the most inner layer, was the inner city, or Nei Cheng, and this was where the actual tomb, including the pyramid, was situated. I will post a diagram of the Emperor Tomb's layout on my Instagram so all of you can get a better idea of what it looked like. Besides the nine main Emperor Tombs, there are also approximately 250 to 300 smaller tombs, which were family members of the Emperor as well as officials and esteemed figures of the Xisha dynasty. These smaller tombs also serve the purpose of accompanying the Emperor in the afterlife, and are hence known in Chinese as Pei Zhang, spelt P-E-I-Z-A-N-G, which means accompanying burial in English. Whilst the emperor tombs are shaped as pyramids, the Pei Zhang tombs were either shaped like thin cylinders, shaped like short and round bread rolls, or shaped like Mongolian gur tents. Since the discovery of these tombs, each tomb has been given a number, starting from the emperor tombs, which have been numbered 1 to 9 respectively, and then so on and so forth with the smaller tombs. The mysterious thing about these tombs is that whilst we know the pyramids were emperor tombs, and the smaller tombs were Peizang tombs, archaeologists haven't been able to identify who exactly these tombs all belong to. So far, only one of these tombs have been identified. Tomb number 7 was identified when a man named Li Fanwen, who wasn't even an archaeologist but just an assistant, managed to piece broken fragments of a headstone of tomb number 7, which had several Tangut characters on it. When Li translated the headstone, it stated that the tomb belonged to the Renxiao Emperor, the fifth emperor of the Xisha dynasty, if you don't count Li Yuanhao's father and grandfather. I hope that after this discovery, Li was promoted. Archaeologists, however, have not been so lucky with the other tombs, 
because the other tombs have been so badly damaged to the extent that it is impossible to find any headstone pieces like Tomb 7 to identify which tomb belongs to who. Hence much is left to speculation. For example, some people say that Tomb number 3, the largest of the lot, belonged to the first emperor of the Xixia, Li Yuanhao. However, others dispute this, saying that the Xixia lacked resources during their early days to build a tomb of such grand scale. The damage of these tombs doesn't end there. Despite its huge size and number of tombs, you'd also be surprised to hear that there haven't been many items that have been found inside these tombs. For example, in tomb number 6, which is one of the larger tombs as it belongs to a Shisha emperor, there is barely anything inside. All that was found was some bronze pins, small pieces of plate armour, bamboo carvings and some ceramic chips. In fact, none of the other emperor tombs had any gold, silver or anything remotely valuable. Which is strange, considering that tombs, especially for the leaders, would be filled with valuables that would be buried alongside the king. Funnily enough, one of the largest and most spectacular things, being a 188kg bronze cow, was found in tomb 177, one of the smaller Peizang tombs. There have been some suggestions that the Tangets practiced Bozang, spelt B-O-Z-A-N-G, which is a simplistic burial without burying a whole lot of gold, silver and other valuables alongside the person, which is in direct contrast with the Han Chinese burial customs, who would bring lots of stuff with them to the afterlife. However, it's more likely, and agreed by most historians and archaeologists, that the Xixia tombs had been subject to multiple grave robberies over the years, both small-scale and large-scale. One of the tombs shows evidence of what looks to be a small-time grave robbery gone wrong. When archaeologists discovered this particular tomb, they found three skeletons inside it, except only one of these skeletons belonged in the tomb. Then, then what about the other two skeletons? <laughs> Upon closer inspection of the other two skeletons, it looked like they had both died of blunt force trauma to the head, which clearly meant that they did not belong to this tomb. The most likely explanation for this weird discovery was that they had both been grave robbers who had made their way into the tomb, where they found some valuable things and were like, Whoa, look at all this, mate! But then got into a scuffle, probably because they both wanted everything to themselves and ended up killing each other in the process. I feel a bit sorry for them for not being able to make it out alive with some gold, even though I shouldn't feel bad for them but grave robberies had stripped many of these tombs bare, and the fact that they protruded out in the form of pyramids, cylinders and bread-shaped mounds made them an obvious target for these robbers. However, what really damaged these tombs looked like large-scale robberies, which not only emptied the tombs of anything valuable, but also deliberately destroyed the tombs in the process. The most likely culprit for the large-scale destruction of these tombs was most likely the Mongols, who invaded Shisha under Genghis Khan in the early 13th century. It was in this campaign with the Shisha that Genghis Khan was reportedly killed in action. The Mongols, angered by the death of their leader, basically tore apart the Shisha kingdom, committing mass genocide on the Tangut people. Taking it further, the Mongol cavalry horde took to the Shisha tombs, deliberately destroying all the emperor tombs and taking everything they could in the process, totally disrespecting the Shisha people. It's even more obvious that the Mongols hated the Shisha, that when the Mongols eventually conquered China and established the Yuan dynasty, they documented the history of the empires in China that had preceded them, including the Song, Liao and Jin dynasties. However, the historians completely disregarded the Shisha dynasty and didn't even record anything about them. This not only shows that the Mongols were most likely the culprits of the mass destruction of the Shisha tombs, but it also means that compared to the other Chinese dynasties, there is little knowledge of the Shisha and its people, hence 
causing a shroud of mystery over these tombs. This is where I'll end the episode of the Shi Sha, and like the mysteriousness of this ancient kingdom, I think this episode has probably given you all more questions than answers on the Shi Sha kingdom, the Tangut people, and the grand but mysterious Shi Sha tombs. I thought I would end this episode on a positive note and say that, despite the fact that these tombs have been heavily damaged over the course of history, efforts have been made to preserve the Shi Sha tombs ever since its discovery in modern times. After the tombs were found in 1970, archaeological diggings officially began in 1972, and in 1988, the Chinese government listed the Shi Sha tombs as a nationally protected historical and cultural site, which meant it was illegal to demolish or damage the site in any way. As of now, in 2022, the Shi Sha tombs are currently on the tentative list as a UNESCO site, and I hope it eventually makes it as an official UNESCO World Heritage Site, because of all the history, culture, and traditions that the Shi Sha tombs represent of the ancient and enigmatic Tangut people. So uh, yeah, that's it. That's the end of the story of the Chinese pyramids. I hope you all liked this episode. If you did, please subscribe to my podcast to keep track of my latest episodes, as well as to tune in to my existing ones. Please also follow my Instagram at Bamboo History Podcast to discover visual content for my podcast episodes, teasers, as well as additional bite-sized history too small to fit into a podcast. As a final note, if you ever wanted to visit the Shi Sha tombs, then head on to the city of Yin Chuan in China, and then either take a taxi or a bus to the tombs, which is 35 kilometers west of the city. If you don't know which bus to take, just ask a local, I'm sure they'll help you out. Okay, that's it from me today. Thanks everyone, have a great day or evening, and I'll see you all next time on the Bamboo History Podcast. Bye for now.